In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. You know, it was about a month ago that a journey began, and today is one of the turning points on our journey to Pascha this year. We've had these last several Sundays preparing us for Lent, which is a preparation for Holy Week, which gets us ready for Pascha itself. We've talked about how this is a journey, on the one hand, to life. We're journeying to the empty tomb, where in that empty tomb we're going to see light dawn and life come forth from the realm of death. But in addition to this being a journey to Christ's resurrection, we've also talked about it being a journey to our own. And if it's going to be a journey to our own resurrection, it's going to be through change that we become different than we were before, and that's what the church calls repentance. The church defines us by being those who are called to change. The word church in Greek is ekklesia, those that are called out, called to be different. And if we don't change, how can we be different? So change is the heart of who we are called to be. And yet we've also talked about how change can seem so hard, and it can even seem too hard, and we can feel like we don't have the strength to change. But of course we do. We reflected a few weeks ago on the Sunday of the prayer scene, the publican, that it's hard for us to hear the word and the call to repent, because it means acknowledging all the aspects of ourselves that we know are weak and sick. And sometimes we're so insecure in our modern days that it's hard to see in our insecurity how we need to change. We looked at how even if we're not okay with ourselves, God is okay with us, and it's okay for us to change because of that. Then we took a deeper dive into that idea when we got to the Sunday of the prodigal son. If there's ever a figure in the Bible that would not be worthy of being received back in the arms of God, it was the the prodigal son. And yet there he is, as Jesus told that story, teaching us about his own father. As the father in the story welcomes back the son that had wasted all of his life's earnings. The father ran to meet the son, kissed him, embraced him, and threw a party at his return. So today is the last time we're going to reflect on this idea of how how do we find the strength to change. Today's reflection is timely because this is the last Sunday preparing us for Great Lent because when the sun that has risen this morning, when it sets tonight, Lent begins. The question is, when it ends, when the journey that we've already begun leads us all the way to the empty tomb, And if God wills, we gather together again to proclaim that Christ is risen. Will we have changed? We were talking about this yesterday in our men's breakfast, and that change is much more than just changing what we do. We have to change what we do because, as one of the men wisely said, when we change what we do, we we change who we become. We become someone we weren't before. Otherwise, our changes are nothing really more than a diet, whether it's a fasting diet or even a spiritual diet of prayer. If we don't change through that process, we've just been on a diet, and God wants something so much more than that for us. And so we enter this Lenten season tonight, and it's going to be a time to to offer ourselves, to expend ourselves in the energy God gives us to continue this journey of change. Whether we feel we don't have enough strength or feel sometimes that we have no strength. I was thinking about, as I was preparing this morning's reflection, and when I thought of the phrase, no strength, I'd have very vivid memory come back to me. I was in high school, and I was running cross country. And cross country then was even shorter than it is now. It was only... I think a little more than three miles only. And this one meet, it was one of the first ones I had run, 
And it was a one-mile lap, so we had done the lap already twice. And now I'm into the third lap thinking, I'm just beginning my last mile. I've done two already, and I can't imagine I'm going to be able to finish. But I kept going up that hill, down the hill, wondering, would anybody see me if I stopped to walk? Because I don't know if I can keep running. And then I rounded the last bend where I could actually see where the race ended. So lots of people who were already long before me having finished the race. I could see them way down the hill, off in the distance. And having thought I had spent almost all, if not all, of my energy, something happened. I looked ahead, and I saw just in front of me other people running the race, and they were still going. And I thought, well, if they have the strength to go, maybe I can keep going. A few more steps. And I kept going, and I kept going. And I found that I was getting actually closer to the people running ahead of me. I had actually, without even knowing it, sped up. I didn't know where the energy came from, but I kept going. And I kept getting closer and closer to that finish line that I could see coming closer and closer, step by step. And I ran faster and faster. And by the time that I finished and crossed the line, I had completed what they often called in cross country a kick. I had finished the race with a kick. I had found energy that I didn't know I had. And I drew upon it, and it took me across the line. But where did I get it from? I got it from God, of course, everything comes from God, but I got it from realizing that if I kept looking forward, it wasn't just the weight of the previous two, two and a half miles that were pulling on me. There was strength to be found ahead of me. That I saw the line and saw the end of the agony, I was in agony at that point. My shins were aching and throbbing, my knees, Every muscle felt like it was just jelly, like I was just going to fall over. And yet as that line got closer and closer, I got more and more strength. I thought about crossing the line so I could stop running, maybe just collapse on the ground. That my teammates would be there to encourage me as they were encouraging the others as they crossed that line. It was looking ahead to that finish line that gave me the strength to keep going and even find strength that I didn't know that I had. My brothers and sisters, that is what the journey to the kingdom of heaven is like. And in one small way, relatively small, that's what Lent is about. We start it often with a little bit of enthusiasm, hopefully, and yet once we get to the third week, the fourth week, the fifth week, It starts to wear on us. But then if we're listening and watching carefully, we start to see the light already shining from the empty tomb. In this church, right at that spot, where we place the epitaphios, the icon of our Lord in the tomb, we begin to proclaim and sing his resurrection. He's barely just been put in the grave and we're already getting ready. Why? Because it draws us. It draws us forward, and that's where we can find the strength to change. Today in the church, one of the themes is that this is the Sunday of the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise, kicked out because they had sinned, and God in his love didn't want them to eat of the tree of life and eternally die. And so he expels them from the garden. Last night we sang and prayed the beautiful hymn. Reflect on Adam sitting opposite from paradise, sitting across the road and looking at the outside of the gates. And Adam wept. And you and I, when we look back, not just to Adam, but to our own past, if we can look at who we are, we're going to weep too. And we should. And yet, we are called not just to look back, but to look ahead. 
Just like I looked ahead to that finish line and it gave me strength, you and I can look ahead, not just to Pascha, as important as that is, but to what Pascha ushers in for all of us. Yes, we're going to proclaim Christ is risen, but running this race and keeping going till the end means that we cross that line, we also will be risen from the dead. And looking ahead to that resurrection can give us the strength to change now. Adam looked back and he saw the closed gates of paradise. But we look ahead, what do we see? The icon of Christ risen, standing on the broken open doors of death with all the broken chains and locks that held us there by our own sins. And by his resurrection, and by our baptism, in which we are baptized into his death and resurrection, we look ahead to our new life. The epistle talked about that today. We heard in the very beginning of the reading. Brethren, salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. When I pulled into church this morning because of daylight savings time, it was night. Pitch black. Doesn't happen very often, but it happened this morning. But now look at the day. Sun shining brightly as a gift of God to remind us that, as St. Paul says, the day is at hand. And he goes on to say, let us then, therefore, cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. That's the change. Exchanging the darkness for the light and our works of darkness into works of light. The gospel also talked about this near the very end. It said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. We look back at our own history as a race. We look back on our own lives. And we see a lot of moth and rust and thieves. Think about just this past year. Not only a worldwide pandemic, that was bad enough. But we met this pandemic by and large, not as a race, not even as a whole country. We took it on as a political battle, which shows you the depth of corruption in our society, and if we're honest, inside each of us. Where inside each of us, that corruption is there, brought in by our own participation, by our own sins. We don't look back and blame Adam and Eve. We've done enough of our own. And by those sins, we too have been kicked out of paradise. And yet, God wanted something much better for us than this fallen, rusting, corrupting, thieving world. He wanted life. He wanted light. He wanted peace. And so when we wouldn't do it for ourselves, he came and did it for us. And on his cross, took everything that was wrong with this world and made it right. Only as the loving God, he doesn't force it on us. He says, if you want this life that I offer you, come and follow me. And as he had to deny himself, we are going to be called during this Lent and through our entire lives to deny ourselves. Yes, to change. And if we change, then we can see the paradise that's waiting for us. You know, one aspect of that paradise that's very important for us to understand, we heard about it at the very beginning of today's gospel. And when we hear Jesus say, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive yours. And if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will my Father forgive you your trespasses. We hear that as the warning it should be. We should hear it as clearly as Christ said it. He said it two times in two different ways. But the same thing. If we forgive, he forgives. If we don't forgive, he doesn't forgive us. It's plain. 
Don't shade it. Don't say I'm kind of forgiven, I'm working on it. If we forgiven, past tense. So it's the warning we should all hear very crystal clear. But there's another aspect that we should understand about it. Our lack of forgiveness, however great or small, however broad or deep, that lack of forgiveness is corruption. It is sickness. It is where a moth eats cloth. And it's a thief stealing from us. It's a cancer eating us alive. And if we don't accept that and treat it, that cancer is going to grow and it will kill us. When Christ tells us the Father won't forgive us, it's not because the Father has some overinflated sense of justice. He says to us, like he says to many people in the scriptures, do you want me to heal you? He doesn't force it. He invites it. He invites our healing. And if we're going to be healed, we have to remove those tumors within. Those tumors, great and small, of our unforgiveness. Because guess what? There won't be any in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is paradise restored and even better than it was in Eden. And we were invited to forgive. One of the most important reasons is that if we don't, we can't experience paradise. Not just because God kicks us out, but because we keep ourselves out. We choose the corruption of unforgiveness and hide it within and justify it as if it's ever good to keep a disease inside of us. And so our unforgiveness is a disease that our Lord says, you don't want it. It's hurting you. It's killing you. Don't hold on to it. Let me take it from you. And when we forgive, that's exactly what happens. Whoever it is we haven't forgiven doesn't need to deserve our forgiveness. They don't need to ask our forgiveness. We need to give it. And if we don't, then it will kill us. Maybe we've shied away from our change because of our insecurity, not being okay with ourselves and forgetting that God is okay with us. Maybe too many times we didn't change because we forgot that God is our loving Father waiting to welcome us back like he welcomed back the prodigal son. And maybe we haven't found the strength to change because we've been taking difficult steps carrying weights on our shoulder, weights of all kinds of sin, including the sin of unforgiveness. But today we could look ahead and see something different. We can look ahead and see a finish line. We can see paradise where the gates have been opened for us. We began this journey to learn by saying, open to me the doors of repentance. That's the way in. That's the gateway to the kingdom. That's the gateway to paradise. Maybe we felt along the way we have no strength, but we do. We do. We don't have the strength that we thought we had. We have more. We have the strength of somebody looking ahead to the finish line and seeing beyond that line Christ waiting for us. And beyond him, the loving Father waiting to welcome us back. In fact, not even waiting, running out to meet us. And that paradise that awaits us invites us forward and gives us strength. St. Paul said it like this. He said, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not only to me, but unto all of them also that love is appearing. You and I have forgotten too often to love his appearing. He appears ahead of us, waiting for us. He appears next to us, encouraging on. He even appears behind us, pushing us and encouraging us. And too often we have not loved his appearing. So let's repent, let's change. Let's become the people that love his appearing wherever it shows up, 
even when it shows up showing us where we need to change. Let's love that. Let's not hold back from that. Let's love his appearing. And this Lent, and for the rest of our lives, let's find in all of those the strength to change. Because that strength comes from nowhere else but God himself. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.